five. Time to stop playing this national game of hide and seek with the virus. Four. This is a recession, a depression, a slump that's been completely government induced, the government would say, for good reason. We've been treated like fools. We really, really have. And it's only now that people are beginning to quietly wake up and start to distrust what we're being told, which is a great shame. On the first day of Christmas, Boris Johnson gave to me five family dinners, four more weeks of lockdown. One. We have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So here it is, Mini Christmas, as that great 70s band Slade once almost sang. Three households can form a bubble from the 23rd to the 27th of December, according to newly announced rules. Kids can hug grandma and grandpa, but you can forget popping to see the neighbours, to the pub or even to church over the festive period because for joint household bubbles, such trips have been banned. And with a month still to go before Christmas, the bill for lockdowns just landed on our national doormat. Alison and I have delayed this week's Planet Normal blast-off, so we could catch Rishi Sunak's spending review. I think we wish we hadn't. And as lockdowns eased, with regions about to be split into tiers from December the 3rd, will different treatment for different parts of the country be as divisive as it was earlier this autumn? Alison, we're engulfed in another new tsunami. Throw us a lifeline. Help us make sense of it all. Well, Mr Halligan, I think I may have got the key as to why all the planet listeners are feeling like they're living in a different universe. Because they, do you remember those witty and balanced projections? Well, if, if they're correct, we're almost certainly dead now. <laughs> We're doomed. Doom poor. We're actually dead. I feel very discombobulated <laughs> and strange about the country I'm living in, and that's probably because I've passed away. <laughs> so, yes, let's start with Christmas. If I hear anybody else tell me that they're saving Christmas for me, I'm going to go absolutely nuts. I think it's monstrous that we should be given these little presents off the tree by our Prime Minister and the government when Christmas is for all of us to enjoy as we like. And as you said, Liam, forget the 12 days of Christmas. Christmas. Are, are you ready for a bit of singing? Go on then. So on the first day of Christmas, Boris Johnson gave to me five family dinners, four more weeks of lockdown, three extended households, two vaccinations and a COVID mask for free. Hooray! So the- <laughs> Hooray! Sorry about that, folks. But God, you've had your three shreddies this morning, haven't you? I have. But so, so that's the five days of Christmas. If anyone can explain why it starts on the 23rd, which is totally bizarre, because as we know, Liam... Oh, that, that's when every man in the country uh, yes. starts his Christmas shopping, <laughs> that, right? That was exactly what I was going to say. Early. That's early. I'm organised this year. I'm starting on the 23rd. It's amazing what you can buy from a garage when you <laughs> it have is, to. It is. <laughs> Those four-court flowers that will go down so well with her indoors. Years Years ago, I, wor- I worked when I was a teenager, actually, I worked in the Littlewoods ladies' underwear department. And on the 23rd, oh, my God. So all the men, a bit worse for wear, would come in. And they'd look at, Sheepish they'd is look the at word. me and they'd say, how big are you, love? Uh, my wife, she's about this big. How big are you? And they'd be like, you know, oogling you in, in your uniform. Oh, my God. Obviously, big news this week. We've got the new vaccination, the Oxford AstraZeneca. And the good news about that, we'll talk a bit more about vaccination later but the good news about that is it's cheap Liam I think it's about three dollars or something a dose compared to the Pfizer one which is twenty dollars a dose so that's going to be really good for the poorer countries where they've really and it'll be distributed around the world at cost right which is a pretty amazing thing we can all knock capitalism we can all knock big pharma man mm. of course we can but in this case certainly on first inspection we'll see how it rolls out when it comes to it but the news that it will be distributed at cost Mm. around the world. The fact that the UK has been at the forefront of this vaccination discovery process, and we've actually booked more vaccinations per head than any other country in the world. It's not too shabby. 
No, I think it's really good. And and the good news is that this one can be stored normally, so it doesn't have to be squashed in between the the Cornish Mivies and the frozen peas. This is much more easy to distribute. I think the big thing that's going to be kicking off today, Thursday, Liam, is the new tiers are announced. So as we predicted last week on Planet Normal, we're coming out of lockdown, but are we coming out of lockdown? Are we going into lockdown by any other name? And I think the real fear now is that areas will not be put back into tier one, like my area in in East Anglia, where I I found out at the weekend that we've had one COVID death in Cambridge since June, and we've had one death in all of Cambridgeshire since October. It will make no sense to the businesses and the people desperately worried about their jobs to be put into a higher tier, but I have a horrible feeling that's going to happen. And even worse, Liam, London is worrying about being put into a higher tier totally needlessly. Very few areas now in London. The virus is just mopping up in Hounslow and Croydon. But the West End, I I found this out, Liam, I was fascinated. The West End is 4% of UK's GDP. So we cannot afford for that city to be bunged into some meaningless tier on the back of zero evidence that it's needed. And we do have the Tory COVID recovery group now. We had Steve Baker on last week, fantastic guest, basically saying... We're going to want evidence now that these things are doing more good than harm. And I think that jury is very much out on that. People will be learning about the tears literally as Planet Normal is being released on on Thursday. So Mm. you, dear listener, will know more than us. I mean, you always do, but particularly so on this occasion. That's right. But it does seem to me that the lower tiers, tiers one, which are very similar to how it was over the summer, rather than tiers two or three, The fear is that there won't be that many regions in Tier 1. And if lots of regions are in Tier 2 or Tier 3, it will seem like a a near national lockdown. And in some senses, even though I think the Tory backbenchers have changed the political weather, I do think it's now socially acceptable to do as we've been doing for months and months to actually Mm. question lockdown and try and have some kind of cost benefit analysis in terms of non-COVID healthcare that's lost in terms of mental health, education, the economy and all the rest of it. The government still has an incentive, doesn't it, to keep as many different regions at the same tier as possible, which will often mean the higher tier Mm. because the government sort of can't handle it, has nervous breakdowns when there are differences between regions and then those regions can present themselves as being victimised in some way. Think about the political weather that Andy Burnham, the Mm. Manchester mayor, Mm. very effective campaigner, made just a couple of months ago, as I referred to obliquely, in the introduction. So the fear is for me that far more regions of Britain than need to be will be in that higher tier in order to avoid certain regions being made to feel that they're being singled out. So it's still a very, very difficult political circle to square here. So do you think that thousands of jobs a week and a couple of billion quid a day should be being used to buy off the government's political embarrassment? I was struck, Liam, by two fantastic interventions this week by two really respected academics. Professor Carl Hennigan, who we've often quoted, the Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, described as an outlier by uh, Matt Hancock, who isn't a a Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine. He is apparently the Secretary of State for Health. But (laughs) Carl Hennigan says, cases in England continue to fall. If the trend continues, it will be hard to justify tougher tiered restrictions come the 2nd of December. So it's a race against time to get us into these tiers, Liam, because if the figures continue to fall, it becomes a major embarrassment. And just quickly, another brilliant intervention this week by Professor David Spiegelhalter. You'll know, Liam, that he's one of the country's best statisticians. And David Spiegelhalter gave evidence to a common select committee. He said that number 10 had cherry-picked spurious coronavirus data to justify the second lockdown and may have intended to frighten the public. Ministers have eroded public trust by choosing only to show worst-case scenarios, which were often based on out-of-date data, like that 4,000 death. Again, again. deaths a day. Again. Like the 4,000 death graph, yeah. And listen to this for a quiet piece of lethal academic observation. I don't want 
want to ascribe motivation to anyone, of course. But if someone was really trying to manipulate the audience and frighten them and persuade them that what was being done was correct, rather than genuinely inform them, then this is the kind of thing they might do. Boom. Fabulous use of language. Fabulous. Less is more. Yeah. Before we get onto the spending review and then onto our fabulous guest, I just want one more academic reference because a professor at the University of Warwick, an old friend of mine, I must say, and I'm on the advisory board of the Department of Economics at Warwick, but Andrew Oswald uh, and a co-author, they've come up with a really, really interesting paper. And Andrew Oswald was among those at Warwick who was saying earlier, back in the spring, pre the Great Barrington Declaration, that we should be shielding by age so that mm. younger people should be out there in the workforce doing their thing as we selectively shield Absolutely. older workers. Yeah. Uh, and as an economist, that was a very innovative thing for him and his colleagues to say. And they've just come out with some new information, which is very, very interesting. Do you remember when Sir Simon Stevens? The chief executive of the NHS, who isn't a medic, of yes, course, yes. <laughs> perished the thought. He said that if we selectively shield people, it's age-based apartheid. And of course, it's impossible because you've got all these multi-generational families and all the rest of it. And yes, it's true. We have got some multi-generational families. But Andrew Oswald has crunched the numbers. And guess what? 92% of all UK workers live in a household without anybody over 65 wow. years old, right? right? And that holds across the white community and also BAME community. So that's across ethnic minority households as well, where the fear is because of lots of intergenerational living, the idea of selective shielding couldn't possibly work. This new paper by Andrew Oswald, he's actually looked at the numbers and that case is completely blown away. Our findings, says Andrew Oswald and his co-authors at Warwick, buttress the cost-benefit case for age-based policies. Mm. A very, very interesting very. academic intervention. Right, before we come to our masterly economic analysis by someone who happens to be on the rocket who allegedly knows something about this stuff, our weekly update, Liam, from George, you know, our source in the NHS. And I just want to say to listeners now, remember the justification for the second lockdown was that hospitals would be overwhelmed by now. And George says to us, the national picture continues to look promising. COVID occupancy has peaked or fallen in most regions now with just a few pockets of increasing numbers in Kent and Hull and East Yorkshire. And that Liverpool hospital, you'll remember, Liam, where Fergus Walsh did an apocalyptic BBC report, Liverpool at 250 COVID inpatients compared to 463 when the BBC filmed there just over two weeks ago. They're getting one or two new admissions with COVID every day. And the number of patients diagnosed with COVID after admission is in single digits. Now, listen to this. I always try to bring you a really good Velma thing, don't I? Here we go. Here we go. Scooby? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't do Scooby to order, right? It's not how it works. No, I was just, I was just trying to, I was just giving a bit of a nudge. <laughs> Liverpool Hospital's peak was reached four days before the second lockdown started. But you know what? I thought you'd be impressed. I think it's brilliant. It's so What's lucky. that? Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Is it the bugle of the cavalry coming? No, it's <laughs> Ivor Cummings' tiger horn. Oh, tiger horn. It's the tiger horn because we're blowing the tiger horn yeah. and that's what's keeping COVID away. This is the problem, isn't it? This is the reason why the government wants to get locked down in quick, as Carl Hennigan says, so it can then explain the fall of deaths. It can explain the fact that the second wave in terms of deaths is so much lower than the first wave with their lockdown procedures. That's exactly the problem. It's mm. always difficult to prove a counterfactual. That's been the kind of metaphysical conundrum at the heart of our response to COVID since the spring. But we know that Liverpool hospitals peaked four days before lockdown started. Unbelievable. You're the, you know, brilliant statistician and economist. You know what that means. And now you're going to tell us how much SH1T we're going to be in for the next few years with the economy. Well, what we learned from Rishi Sunak just before we blasted off from the launch pad to Planet Normal is that the UK economy won't recover. It won't get back to where it was pre-COVID until the fourth quarter of 2020. 
2022. Absolutely incredible hit to the economy because of lockdown. Of course, this is a recession, a depression, a slump that's been completely government induced, the government would say, for good reason. And in order to pay for all that, all the support measures, furloughing and business support schemes, the loss of tax revenue and all the rest of it means that instead of borrowing around 300 billion quid over the next five years, we're actually going to be borrowing almost 900 billion quid over the next five years. Absolutely huge amounts of money. Uh, The economic impact of this will be with us for a very, very long time, even when GDP, the sort of overall size of the economy, is fully recovered, we're going to be harbouring and shouldering that debt burden for a very long time. It seemed to me that he was obviously trying to sort of sugar the pill as much as he could. He did say that there was going to be something for the low paid, didn't he? I mean, he's going to, was that with the minimum wage, I heard him say? Yeah, there'll be a rise in the minimum wage. And in a very interesting bit of Rishi spin, his people having briefed the press, there would be a public sector pay freeze Mm. across the board. He then actually rolled out a public sector pay freeze only for certain parts of the public sector with nurses and doctors getting a pay rise and also others who earn below the median, the average, if you like, wage within the public sector, also getting a bit of a bump up in their pay. So that didn't seem as draconian to people on the left of politics as it otherwise would. I actually think the public sector pay freeze, on balance, whisper it, would have been quite popular. Absolutely. When you think that only a fifth of people work in the public sector. And as Sunak pointed out, he said, I can't justify an across-the-board rise across the public sector because so many in the private sector, even if they're lucky enough to have been furloughed, that's a 20% wage Mm. cut there, Mm. uh, at least given that at max you get 80% of your wages when you've been furloughed, but only up to two and a half grand a month. So for a lot of people, they would have had huge cuts to their wages in the private sector. And of course, in the public sector, you so often have these final salary pension schemes, which were worth you know at least another quarter on your wages Mm every month and these are unheard of now in the private sector so I think he's played a very political and clever game with public sector wages but when you think about it he might save you know a couple literally two or three billion quid by partially freezing public sector wages but he's just announced extra borrowing of 900 billion pounds so these small relatively small headline grabbing which everyone will angst about and Mm. and and focus on because yes it does affect people's lives in the here and now but the big fiscal picture is that these frontline immediate changes they're less than rounding errors in the overall picture of what's actually going on here so do you think he's avoiding the sort of bleakest outlook at the moment? Is that is he is he trying to buy himself some time? Because unemployment is obviously going to rise, isn't it? I don't I actually I don't think so. I think he is trying to get all the bad news out there now. He didn't mince his words, you know, the Office of Budget Responsibility has says this we'll have an 11.3% contraction in GDP in 2020. That is one of the worst performances, if you like, in the Western world. That's partly because we're a service sector superpower. So much of our economy is about human interaction and customer-facing stuff, Mm. which is very, very difficult to do, Mm. even over Zoom on lockdown. And also we have London, the global hub. We've been hit Mm. particularly hard by COVID. So it's no wonder that our economy has contracted. He said, or the OBR says that unemployment will be something like 7.5% next year, 2.6 million. As you know, I think that's a really, really big underestimate. I think unemployment's already at that level, even still with millions of people on furloughing. The government's using a particular definition of unemployment that I think understates what's truly happening. But we'll come back to that in future weeks, Alison. Uh, He's also tried to appeal to the so-called Red Wall, the conservative seats that they won Mm. in the North and Midlands for the first time with this big £100 billion capital spending budget and a new UK infrastructure bank. There's a levelling up fund, which is £4 billion, Pounds, But he said, and this will prove controversial, local authorities can bid for these projects. They must have real impact. They must be delivered within this parliament. Now, the National Audit Office is going to be all over that because Labour will accuse the Tories of, I'm not saying it will happen, but we'll see, of deliberately focusing on marginal seats Mm. to deliver that infrastructure spending rather than seats where they've got no chance of winning. Pork barrel politics.
It begins as a love story. Couples who meet as young activists, bonded in a fight against injustice. We seem to have similar outlooks in life. He often made me feel very special. It felt like we were in love. I remember it being quite magical. As far as I was concerned, we had a future together. I fully did envisage my future with him. But then he starts acting strangely. Suddenly there were secrets and there were inconsistencies and there were things that didn't make sense. Then one day he leaves. I came home from work and I realised immediately that he'd gone. Vanishes without a trace. And the reason why these men disappear is so disturbing, it's led to a formal apology from the state. I never for a moment thought that it would be what it actually turned out to be. This is Bed of Lies, the true story of one of the biggest scandals in recent British history and the latest podcast from The Telegraph. Talk about the Stasi in East Germany. That's not how we understand our society. A tale that travels from the safety of a loving bedroom to the very heart of the law. Search for Bed of Lies wherever you're listening to this. Now onto our Planet Normal guest slot and what a treat we have in store. There aren't many journalists, Alison, in the UK, proper journalists with genuine reporting experience who become truly national figures. You've invited one to Planet Normal this week, a Romford-born lad who didn't go to university, but he's built an incredible career across print and television based on canny news judgment, an empathy with ordinary people and that winning glint in his eye. Yes, Liam, I'm absolutely delighted to have interviewed Richard Maidley, probably best known as Richard of Richard and Judy, but also, as you say, a significant, hugely popular broadcaster and writer in his own right. Richard had me onto his show on Talk Radio and he said, can I come on Planet Normal? Can I come on Planet Normal? I said, well, I think we can. And we said, mm, yeah, we'll, we'll think about we'll it, think, Richard. Well, You're yeah. not quite up to snuff, really. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Will, it, will anyone have heard of you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But Liam, Richard, like us, has arrived at this position on the whole COVID crisis, I think has gone from trusting the government and thinking it was doing well to being absolutely furious and hurling things at the at the television and, um, and so on. Richard wrote an article this week titled, A National Pretend Lockdown is What Happens When We Were Lied To. So I asked Richard, does he really think we've been lied to? Oh, I think in virtually every single Downing Street press conference, particularly those uh, which have been populated by the balance witty combo, we get fibbed to. And I think that is fundamentally why the second lockdown has become pretty much a national pretend lockdown, as I, as I put it, because people have stopped trusting the science, because the scientists, particularly witty and balance, don't trust the people with the truth. It's a very simple equation. And after a while, you get a quiet revolution. I mean, you're, you're not seeing sort of, you know, mass disobedience in the streets. What you're seeing is, is a quiet return in many parts of the country, certainly my part of North London, to what looks like normality. I wrote in that article that uh, when I went out on the very first morning with my kind of journalist hat on of the first lockdown in March, it was like a neutron bomb had gone off. There was nothing moving except cats and dogs and the odd jogger. Mm. But uh, this this time when I went out on day one, frankly, it looked like a normal day. Bags of traffic on the road. There were loads and loads of people swanning around shops, which last time in the lockdown were firmly shut. But lots and lots of shops have found ways, very clever little dodges to keep open. And good luck to them. You know, I don't blame them. This is their, their lifeblood that we're talking about. So that's what happens when you lose faith in the experts. I don't know if you, about you, but I actually quite like them at the very beginning. I quite like Witty. I quite trusted his face. You know? Oh, I did. Um, yeah. All that's evaporated. And now, even if they may be giving us accurate information, I just have to discount what they say and draw my own conclusions. And I think that's what so many people are doing now on this so-called lockdown. So we're seeing this chasm opening up in a way, aren't we, between people like us who mistrust the information, and yet still we have your favourite person, Richard, Neil Ferguson, being uh, wheeled out onto these shows. Tell me what you think about Professor Ferguson. Well, I thought that he basically, you know, had been buried in a deep, dark hole um, <laughs> and had become a nondescript person in terms of the, the mm. whole 
lockdown discussion because of what he did. He told us that we had to lock down. Uh, the lockdown was based on the, the advice that he gave the government, the figures that he gave the government. All sorts of, um, of experts in so-called modelling came forward to say that his computer programme, which, which predicted hundreds of thousands of cases if we did nothing, was nonsense. And then we discovered a lot more about him, that his background at Imperial College is checkered with these kinds of grotesquely exaggerated mm. predictions. Mm. Nevertheless, he was listened to. We were tipped into the first lockdown. He was at the forefront of it. It's his science that it was based on. And what happens? He gets his girlfriend over to his house. He breaks his own lockdown. <laughs> now, this isn't like going into a shop forgetting to wear your mask. No. You know, this isn't an accidental technical yeah. breach. He knew exactly what he was doing when he made arrangements to have his girlfriend come over to his house for a bit of nooking. <laughs> and he knew that he was breaking lockdown. It, it, as I say, it wasn't an inadvertent slip up. It was a calculated risk. And he got caught out uh, and he had to resign from SAGE. But he stayed on in his, in his role at Imperial mm -hmm. College, which still has a role in advising government. And for reasons which I absolutely, as, as a former news editor myself, having taken these decisions on a mm -hmm. daily basis in radio and television and a news reporter as well, I cannot understand why Radio 4's news editor or news producers are booking this simple mm. expert to appear and opine on programmes like PM and programmes like Today. The public have no faith in him. He's had to resign, and yet they trot him out without a word of apology, without any qualification. In fact, when I first heard him on Radio 4 about, it was about two months ago, long after he, he resigned from SAGE, I didn't know it was him. I just heard this rather boring voice droning on, being a little bit, I thought, unnecessarily pessimistic about the future. And then at the end, they said, Professor Neil Ferguson, thank you for your time. And I was astounded, absolutely astounded, almost as if it, they'd made a mistake and they'd forgotten or whoever booked him onto the programme sort of didn't know their recent current affairs history. But no, it was him. And he's, I've heard him on several times since. And I just don't understand it. And if I, if I was friends, if I knew the head of news at Radio 4, I'd phone him up or her up and I'd say, what are you doing? Why are we having to listen to this man? We don't trust him. I'm like you. I see absolute red. You know, I mean, my poor radio would just be hurled across the <laughs> bloody room every time he's on. He gave this excuse, didn't he, which is that, oh, well, I've had it. This is the COVID. And, and whether the girlfriend or the mistress or yeah. whatever had had yeah. it. So I thought it would be all right. And I thought... Oh, but I thought... But I... Well, I, well how come Boris Johnson's in, in a two-week personal lockdown then? Because he's had it. No, I know. but <laughs> No, exactly. But what I was thinking is... Behind Behind closed doors, they've got all these little bits of knowledge, haven't they? Yes, Which exactly. they, if they had said to the British public, well, if you've had it, then maybe it would be OK to see your mum. But none of that was forthcoming to the general public, was it? No, because we're too stupid, you see, to understand nuance. We're, we're too stupid to understand subtlety. We're, we're idiots and, and we'll seize upon exceptions and arguments for being able to do something which lockdown would normally prevent us from doing. We, the people, are far too stupid to understand that. That's the kind of thing that's only understood by experts like him mm. and his cohorts. No, it's another sign, it's, and it's a very good point, Alison, and it hadn't actually occurred to me. It's another sign of the contempt with which mm. the British public has been held in since this thing kicked off. We've been treated like fools. We really, really have. And it's only now that people are beginning to quietly wake up and start to distrust what we're being told, which is a great shame, because we only obey laws by consent. And some laws are good laws. And there may be some things to do with the second lockdown, which elements of it, which are possibly a little bit worthier than others. And it's hard to think of one. If there are, or if there were, they're being completely discounted by more and more, by millions of people. I mean, I, I was on talk radio about three weeks ago. Well, you you, you know, you were a guest on, on yes, the show. Yes, we, we had a good rant then as well, didn't we? We had a good, we had a lovely rant <laughs> then. I felt much, much better after it. Um, as, I, as I'm already now, I can feel my spirits lifting. <laughs> and I don't think it was the day that you came on, but uh, it was it was in the wake of Victoria Darbush uh, saying in an interview to the Radio Times that, that actually screw lockdown at Christmas, screw the rule of six, she would be having more than six people to her house for Christmas dinner and she didn't care who knew it. Well, actually, it turned out she kind of did care who knew it because she got into trouble and she had to apologise the next day. I'm not sure how sincere the apology was. Mm. Maybe she meant it, maybe. But anyway, probably a political, you know, withdrawal. Mm. That was the that was a spark for me to ask my listeners what they were planning to do this Christmas. Now, this is before the second lockdown, yeah, mm. when most people were labouring under rule of six. And I specifically, on my producer's instruction, I specifically said, please tell me if you're planning to follow the rules this Christmas and, and why, why you think it's important. I did not get one tweet, email, 
text message from a single listener saying that they were going to follow the rules this Christmas. All I got was an absolute barrage of people saying, and it was quite clear from the way many of these messages were written, these were intelligent, thoughtful, Uh basically normally law-abiding people Uh who were letting me know off the record, a lot of them didn't use their real names, they had no intention of following rule of six at Christmas, they were going to break it. And that actually, and I don't know if you agree, but I think that's why we're in the second lockdown now. I think that the government could see from programs like that and from polls that were being taken and, and the word on the street that when it came to Christmas, most people, if they, if, if they needed to break the law, were going to break the law. And that's why we've had the lockdown. It's, it's a pantomime. And I don't think this lockdown is going to be particularly effective because so many people aren't observing it as they did the first one. But at the end of it, the government will pretend that we've sort of earned the right mm. to have a little Christmas, which actually most people were going to take anyway. We had previously on the Planet Normal, a wonderful Professor Sunetra Gupta, who I know you'll be familiar with. Oh, yes. She's great, great Barrington Declaration. And she called it a societal pantomime. And I thought, well, we're not having any other kind of pantomime this Christmas, but, <laughs> but we're having the government pantomime, which is that suddenly children under 12 have to be included in our oh, England's rule of six, but not in Scotland or Wales's rule of six. So Absolutely. is it any wonder, Richard, that people are just increasingly incredulous at these? As you say, we're most people very law abiding, but just increasingly yep. thinking, what on earth are they banging on about? And like Liam and I, you found yourself as a reviled lockdown sceptic, <laughs> someone who is accused of wanting to let the virus rip let through the population. Rip. Yes, can yes, you, as if, as if. Can you, as if? Can you tell me a bit about your how your thinking evolved on COVID? At first, uh, like most people, I thought that the uh, and I still think this with, with hindsight. I, I thought that the first lockdown was frankly the only way to go. Mm. We knew virtually nothing at all about the virus then. There were terrifying scenes uh, over in Italy and the hospital wards there that was spilling out into the corridors. I mean, it really did look as if we had a a major, major problem here. And we didn't really know how to tackle it because we just didn't know enough about the virus. So we had to have a lockdown. And I I still think that that was the right decision. And like most Mm. people, I obeyed it with a a full heart and uh, as most people did. But then as the weeks and months ticked on, we started to learn more about the virus. For example, we began to understand that most people or large numbers of people are completely asymptomatic when they contract it. The only reason that they know they've got it is because they go for a test or they're tested. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known that they'd had it. Other people get very, very mild symptoms. The vast majority of people, the huge majority of people, get completely better. You do have these tragic exceptions, mostly, almost almost exclusively affecting people in their 80s and above, or people with severe underlying problems like diabetes, severe obesity. Mm. That, we, we all know this mm. now. We do know that there are cases there where people tragically die. And I'm not just saying that spuriously. I'm not just covering my back and saying oh, it's tragic. Of course it's tragic. And in my book, it's actually doubly tragic because these people are supremely unlucky. You have to be very unlucky to get very ill Mm. or to get long COVID, as they've called it, or to die from COVID. You have to be really, really unfortunate because actually the odds are stacked in most people's favour massively. Now, we know that now. We didn't know that then. And a few weeks ago, I, I wrote another article where I said that it was time to stop playing this national game of hide and seek with the virus. We're not crushing it or, or pushing it down. I began to realise this. We're just simply hiding from it for, say, a month or mm. two months or three months. And when we come out, the virus, metaphorically speaking, has been leaning on an lamppost, smoking the fag, waiting for us to come out of the front door again. And it pounces on us again. <laughs> Richard, I was watching Good Morning Britain, waiting for you and Judy to come on. And there was Piers Morgan talking about COVID as if it's still some lethal plague, not a virus from which 99.7% of people, if you've just said, make a full recovery. Mm. Why do you think peers and others in the media have stuck so resolutely with this fear agenda? Well, as far as Piers is concerned, I don't know. Um, I haven't had the argument with him yet. He didn't. I, I wish it had come up today because I would have thoroughly... I wish it had yeah, come, I I wish it had come up. Yeah. I, I mean, I... I know and like Piers, and I have enormous respect for him. Mm. He's, a, he's, a, he's a fantastic journalist and a great broadcaster, you know, and I'm not just saying that, he really is. He's, and he's a friend. I've known Piers for well over 30 years since he was on The Sun as a showbiz reporter. And I would like to ask him why he's taken that firm view, because I just don't see how, faced with the facts and the evidence, you can form that view. You know, he's an individual presenter. He's a maverick. You know, um, he does he does take contrary positions. He does take sort of um, highly personalised uh, standpoints, and that's, that's part of his shtick. And that, that, so that's all fine. What really bothers me about the media, the mainstream media, is how so much, and I'm talking about broadcast media, it's about how so much of the broadcast media has simply swallowed the constantly changing, mm. ever-exaggerated government 
line, hook, line and sinker. Mm. I don't understand it. I'm waiting for the panorama. You don't use that word in quite the same way as you used to before <laughs> the news about that broke yeah. uh, earlier. But I'm, I'm waiting for the panorama special to uncover the obvious obfuscations and, and misdirections that we've been getting over the last six months, nine months. But it hasn't happened. Mm. Frankly, it's only the newspapers, not, not even all of them. It's only the newspapers and outspoken commercial radio stations like talk radio, which has taken a resolute trenchant stance against lockdown, not at the beginning, but in the way that you just asked me to explain how my thinking changed, because their thinking journalistically has changed in that time. But the mainstream media mm. just keeps parroting, totally accepting and spewing out to us sitting at home watching at six o'clock and 10 o'clock, the same old rubbish. And I don't understand it. As a journalist, I, I'm genuinely puzzled by it. I, I can see how the government has been intimidated by the naysayers and the doom mongers. I can see how that's happened mm. and how, how difficult it is for them. I feel very sorry, actually, for this government. I feel very sorry for Boris. It's, it's, a, it's not just one poison chalice. It's three of them. He's having to juggle them on a tightrope. It's a nightmare. <laughs> but as far as journalists working for our main national broadcaster, the BBC, how they have allowed themselves to follow like sheep what the government is telling them and what people like Witty and Valance are telling them and getting Ferguson back on air, all of that baffles me. We had the lovely Sue Cook, you know, veteran oh, BBC yeah. reporter. And Sue was saying, where are the people asking the basic questions about the tests? Why aren't they sending people out to the labs? And we've actually had someone, Richard, an informer basically within the NHS saying that the hospital admissions figures are being massaged in a most extraordinary way so that... They say, oh, there were 1,600 admissions today, but it's really only 340. Yes. And they've added people who were tested positive for COVID in hospital without any symptoms. And uh, not only that, but then people who have actually caught COVID in hospital are then added to the admissions and backdated. I mean, if this was going on in any other arena, the news programmes would be on it like a shot, wouldn't they? They certainly would. And I mean, you, your, your informer, even if she was willing to be interviewed in, in silhouette and in, in full disguise, she ain't going to get the call from the BBC or frankly, I, ITV news either. They're just, they don't seem interested in uncovering what are clearly blatant misdirections, as I keep saying, coming from government. And, and you know, I've been in journalism since I was 16. I know a story when I see one. Mm. Uh, and there are some very good stories. I mean, to just set aside our outrage and our seeing red, Alison, but as, mm. as a journalist, there are some damn good stories out there at the moment, and they're just not being covered. Uh, and it simply baffles me. Maybe there's a sense in the big institutions that it's risky, that they could be blamed possibly for mm. sort of dissolving the lockdown spirit. I, I don't know, but it's utterly baffling and infuriating, absolutely infuriating. And it's it's a dereliction of duty. I feel actually quite let down by by my profession on this, on yes. this story. They're mm. missing a big story that's right in front of them. It's right at the end of their nose and they don't seem able to see it. We've had lots of Planet Normal listeners saying they will never vote Tory again after the chaos of, of the pandemic, after people not being allowed to see their loved mm. ones in care homes. Do you think the Conservatives are going to struggle? Do you think people like Nigel Farage's Reform Party will have more of a chance now? Personally, no, because in, in my experience of covering these stories, people have very short memories. And we now have what looks like three vaccines, which should work very well. Unless the government screw this up, as they've screwed everything else up so far, assuming that we get the vaccines rolled out to everybody by, you know, next late spring, summer, mm. by this time next year, it'll be behind us. It'll be gone. It, it won't be an issue anymore, except for when we have to go for a booster jab. And I think other issues will simply crowd this out. I think if this was happening in an election year, if there was an election due, say, next March, yes, it absolutely would have mm. an impact mm. and possibly change the result of the election. So talking about real Conservatives, we've just seen Pretty Patel being obliged to apologise for her allegedly bullying in the Home Office. Does this new definition of bullying ring true to you, Richard? I mean, we both as young people spent spent time in newsrooms, didn't we? Yeah. Where a day when you weren't kind of called something appalling and shouted at by a very angry small <laughs> Glaswegian was, 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 rare, was rare indeed. What's your take on it? Well, to be honest with you, Alison, I was, I was flabbergasted going back six months when Sir Philip Rotnam, you know, the head of her department, mm -hmm. resigned mm -hmm. in, in what looked like a fit of pique. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember the pictures when he, he walked yes. out of the cameras. But I've never seen a more petulant looking civil servant. Absolutely. And I have to say, I, I thought just 
way back then, I thought, well, you know, I think I'd probably want to shout at you as well. You, you're a very irritating looking <laughs> man. The thing about what Priti Patel has been accused of and has admitted to, and of course, we haven't seen the full report, but we, we've all seen the leaks. What it seems to come down to is that when she was being obstructed uh, by her civil servants or, or misinformed or under-assisted by them, she'd lose her temper. Mm. Well, that to me isn't the definition of bullying. The definition of bullying is when you pick on somebody insistently for no good reason at all, simply to kind of feed your own sadistic desires. And you and you basically mount a, a continuous campaign, be it verbal or physical, against an individual, mm. or somebody that you mm. punch every time you pass them in the school corridor, or in this case, someone that you consistently abuse and shout at. I don't believe that's the allegation at all. I think the allegation is that she had a tendency to explode with frustration. Well, excuse me. And I know this, is, this has been uh, quoted a few times. I go right back to Harry S. Truman. And uh, he said this in 1949. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Now, the, the home office is not the vicarage. You know, the home office is one of the great offices of state. Mm. The home office is probably at the front line of more contentious and difficult and blood pressure rising or raising Absolutely. than mm. any other department, possibly than even the Treasury. And I would expect it to be a white hot crucible. Now, that doesn't mean that people should lose their heads or should become unnecessarily abusive. But as you say, you and I spent our careers in the early days in hot newsrooms. Mm. And, you know, I was shouted at. I had typewriters thrown at mm. me uh, by enraged subs because I'd got a story wrong. I'd, mm. I'd written too much. I'd written too little. I never, ever considered that that was being bullied. I mean, I had been bullied, but that wasn't bullying. That was what happens in a crucible. You know, you get fizzing and sparking mm. and, and popping and banging, you know, it's life. And as Truman said, if you can't stand it, don't follow that career. On Planet Normal, Rich, we're interested in how people became successful. You're an Essex boy <laughs> born in Romford. I was looking at the dates and I think my aunt was training as a midwife in um, Romford <laughs> Hospital around the time you were born. So you may have been, you may have been delivered by Auntie Irie, which is a lovely thought. I heard your first ambition was to be a pilot in the RAF, but your eyesight wasn't good enough and you yeah. followed your father into journalism. First job was with the Brentwood Argus. Yes. What happened is I, I, I'd written to the editor of the Brentwood Argus, Brian Davis, who's still very much with us, and I'm, I'm going to see him actually next week. And I got this letter back by the first post the next day, because there were two posts in those days, and it was an incredible brush off from Brian, the editor, basically saying, sod off, kid. You're only 16. We haven't got space uh, in our busy newsroom to put you up making coffee for, for I'd ask for a week's <laughs> equivalent of work experience. Thanks for asking. Bye. And I was really rocked back on my heels by this. Then in the second post, I got another letter from him saying, I'm really sorry. Sorry about that first letter. I, I just had a major row with the, my chief sub. I come in tomorrow, he said, I can't give you a week, but I'll give you 20 minutes and I'll tell you how it works. So I went in the next day and I was on my summer holidays. I was due to go back, do A-levels. And then the plan was to do an English degree at uni and then hopefully get a graduate training place on something like The Guardian or The Telegraph or something like that. And I went and saw him. And at the end of 20 minutes, because I knew a bit about the business because dad had told me so many stories about it. And I knew it was what I wanted to do. He just looked at me and said, do you want to start tomorrow? And I said, what, you mean for a week? He said, no, no. He said, we'll put you on, on indentures. He said, that's what we call an apprenticeship in newspapers. You're 16 now. You're old enough to start. You'll be 19 when you finish. You'll be a trained journalist. The world will be your oyster. What do you say? I said, I'll have to ask my mum and dad. So I went <laughs> home and mum was mum was dead against it. No, mm. her son was going to uni and that was that. But dad, when he came home from the office, listened carefully and he phoned all his journalist contacts and he had a, a book full of them. And every single one, without exception, said, if he knows that ultimately this is what he wants to do, you know, in five years from now, do it now and, and he'll be ahead of it. So I did. And I was a bit worried that night, but I went in the next day. And after my first day in a proper newsroom, I realized that I absolutely, I was like a pig in swill. I was just <laughs> so happy. I was, I was in my home. I, I adored it. Age just 19. I mean, a kid, you joined BBC Radio Carlisle as a, as a news producer and presenter, quickly moved on to Border Television and then Yorkshire Television. And after two years presenting reports for Calendar, which was Yorkshire's regional news program back then, you went to work for Granada. TV where eyes locked across a crowded room with one <laughs> Judy Finnegan. Yeah. What Granada had in those days in the, in the newsroom, they had a thing called the parenting scheme. Somebody who, who joined the newsroom at whatever level was assigned a, quote, parent, unquote, and it was always a member of the opposite sex. I don't know why, but that's what they did. So the first time Judy talked to me, I just felt two hands on my shoulders as I was settling in at my desk and organising my typewriter, remember them? Yeah. Oh, um, yes. And I felt this tapping on my shoulder behind me, and I turned around, and it was Judy, and she said, hi, I'm your mummy. <laughs> uh, and I thought, this is weird. <laughs> uh, and then she explained. And it was basically, it was to show you where the toilets were and the canteen were and where you parked and all that. That kind of stuff. I must say, just as a, as a quick aside, that my entire life since that moment, or just before that moment, 
is down entirely to Rubik's Cube. It's on these tiny sixpences that our fates spin and pivot. About three weeks before that, I was still at Yorkshire Television and I got drunk the night before and I, it was in late for the news conference, which was a cardinal sin. Uh, I was a reporter presenter there. And because I was late, I got given the worst assignment of the day. And I was sent up to York University to cover an international conference on Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and it was basically incredibly dry, dull mathematicians yes. talking about the, uh, the, the algorithms, whatever they would be, of, of how Rubik's Cube worked and what it told us about maths. Oh my God. So I went up to the university and I did my best with it. And I tried to jolly it up and I closed it with a piece of camera. And it was the old Rubik's Cube joke. You hold up a, a, a disassembled Rubik's Cube with all the different coloured squares, right? Mm. And, you, and, and you're doing your piece of camera, the closing link, saying whatever I was saying, and you slowly drop it out of shot. And on a little ledge, just, just out of camera shot, there's one that's all been done with all the sides covered. And you pick that up <laughs> seamlessly and you bring it back up as if it's the same one. And then, you, and I think I said something like that, and look at that, I'm all fingers and thumbs today. That took me three seconds. Uh, ha, 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 that was the line. This report went out on Yorkshire Television that night on calendar fronted by the lovely Richard Whiteley. There was an ITN executive in a Leeds mm. hotel watching the regional news and he saw this report and he, he liked the joke at the end and he picked up the phone to News at 10 and said, have you got the Anne finally yet for tonight? And they said, no, no, we can't find anything. He said, I think I've just seen it. And he oh. told them that, and they went up the line to Yorkshire. They sent it down the line, my report, and blow me down because they used to take regional reports in those days. Blow me down. I'm on News at 10 that night. Oh. I told my mum, my dad, all my family, my sister, you know, I was on News at 10 and they ran it and they ran my, my Rubik's Cube joke. Simultaneously, watching from his bath in Manchester was the head of news at Granada Television. He saw this and he was, as that moment, he was looking for a third reporter presenter to join Judy ah. and the lovely Tony Wilson on Granada Reports. And he saw me and he thought, that's the guy, he fits. And I got the call the next day and I went across, didn't, didn't get interviewed for the job, we just talked terms and I got the job. And it's all because of getting pissed and Rubik's Cube. It's amazing, <laughs> it's amazing. Getting pissed, turning up late for news conference and being given the bum, the bum assignment. Absolutely. That's abso absolutely brilliant. <laughs> absolutely. You and Judy became, of course, the king and queen of daytime TV. I always think about watching you, that you were doing a bit of what Liam and I in our small way are trying to do on Planet Normal, just giving voice to what people feel. And I've got a favourite quote from about Charles Dickens, um, Richard, which I thought you'd like. And somebody said about Dickens... He didn't know what the people wanted. He wanted what the people wanted. Ah, very good. And, and I think that's a world of difference between some people who really haven't got a clue about normal people um, and yet who are in charge of us. And uh, I think a lot of what goes wrong in society stems from that. But one of the truly enduring things you've done is the Richard and Judy Book Club, which brought about fantastic change in the nation's reading habits and titles chosen by the book club have sold 10 million copies and all sorts of marvellous things. And now you're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Richard and Judy Book Club at WH Smith and you've picked the best dozen titles from the last decade. And, and I know you've made some special podcasts with the authors. You have become a successful author yourself with titles like Someday I'll Find You and Fathers and Sons. Richard, if you were asked to write a book about 2020, this most surreal of years, what would... What would you put into it, do you think? What would be the shocking and uplifting things? That's a hard question. Um, I think probably because we've had so much misery and so, and so much disappointment and cynicism, I think if I was to write a story, I'd probably loop it around the race for the vaccine. Mm. Because that's really mm. dramatic. I mean, what they've done yeah. um, in, in, what, 10 months mm. normally takes up to 10 years. It's incredible. I know they've thrown the kitchen sink at it. I know, it's, you know the, the money hasn't been any object. But all the same, that's a great story. And I think probably I would try and, and find the people at the heart of it working 20-hour days and stuff. And I'd build, probably build a romance in as, as well at the same time. And I would just love writing the chapter where they get the results and they realise they've done it. They've actually got a 90 percenter on their hands. So, yeah, I'd probably write something around the hunt for a vaccine. One final question. Mm. So if you had Planet Normal beamed you into number 10 and you had five minutes alone with Boris today, what, what would your advice to him be? I would tell him if he's not already planning to do this, and I think those changes that he made to his personal staff last week indicates that he might be thinking a bit more flexibly now, but I would say to him, Boris, for God's sake, you've got to broaden the church of advice that you're getting. You cannot keep taking advice from this, this sliver of so-called expert opinion opinion, when you've got so much uh, expert opinion, Nobel Prize winners out there who are telling you the opposite. You've got to get more people into the big tent and you've got to take a much broader uh, range of advice and from that 
make a much more balanced set of decisions. Would you ever go into politics? I think I'd vote for the Richard and Judy party. <laughs> the trouble with me is, in that sense, is I observe politics, and I've I've actually voted for both the main parties uh, here, mm. you know, back and forth over over my life. Uh, because I always vote for the party that I think is going to do the best job at the time. So, for example, if the Labour Party had been uh, led by a decent moderate against the useless uh, Theresa May, I probably would have voted Labour last time, because I, I, I'm not interested in ideology. I don't care about it. Um, it, it doesn't a, a appeal to me at all. So I'm completely apolitical. So I don't think I'd make a very good politician, because I, I don't think any party would want to have me, because I wouldn't be interested. <laughs> I just wouldn't be interested in, in, in their ideologies. Well, I think a lot of people would vote for you, and you've been a brilliant guest for Planet Normal. I've enjoyed it. Can I close with another Harry Truman quote? You this is a great can idea. close with another Harry Truman quote. This is specifically for Witty and Valance, right? He said, if you can't convince them, confuse them. Wow. Mainstream broadcasters are swallowing, accepting, parroting, spewing out the same old rubbish, says Richard Maidley. How have they allowed themselves to follow like sheep what the government tells them? It baffles me. Fantastic interview, Alison. It's quite lethal stuff, but he delivers it so charmingly, doesn't he? But by God, it hits home. I mean, um, talking about witty and valance, don't trust the people. We're seeing a quiet revolution as people just go about, you know, choosing what laws they're going to obey and not obey because the whole thing's become farcical. You can probably tell I just love talking to him. He he goes off on these brilliant tangents, but he's a news hound at heart isn't he I mean, proper journalist proper, proper journalist. journalist and talking about the broadcast media swallowing the exaggerated government line and waiting for that panorama special into you know exposing all these half truths and i i agree with him about being disappointed in our profession i don't know what you think liam no i think i think that's right i think some newspapers including ours have had a much broader mm. range of opinion i'm i'm proud of the telegraph for that and we've always been careful in our writing and our discussion to single out the, the mainstream broadcasters because it is very, very disappointing. You and I grew up on BBC Television mm. News, on ITN Television News. I spent a lot of my career at ITN, as, as you know, and I know those places have lots of good journalists between them. And yet there's been almost no challenge to this endlessly doom-mongering narrative. And I actually think... The broadcasters, the mainstream broadcasters, have done a lot to scare the public. And you feel that with the best will in the world, you can't help but conclude, Alison, that, it, that it's been deliberate. No, I think that's right. I mean, I know you and I were having a chat. We we should tell the listeners, we have a little planning chat on Tuesday evening, don't we, when I'm having a glass of wine. we were watch, I think we're both watching Channel 4 News. I can hear the listeners all being astonished that any of this is planned because it doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, 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 there is some method in this madness, but we'd both been watching the Channel 4 News and it was literally, wasn't it, one item after the next of, is this even worse than the first wave? Well, no. Are, are five days off at Christmas going to cause all this sort of massive, horrible after effects? Well, probably not. And I think there is just that furious disbelief, which I think Richard captured so well. And wasn't he brilliant on the Pretty Patel bullying allegations as well. You know, I loved his his description of Sir Philip Rutnam. <laughs> he said that he would have shouted at him. <laughs> so time for some reader emails. Please keep your emails coming at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. We absolutely love hearing from you. Liam and I are picking up so many good stories and a real insight into what's going on. Here's an email that caught my eye this week. Liam, this is absolutely fascinating. This comes from Lucy, who works for Test and Trace. Lucy says that 111 are encouraging people now with COVID to go to hospital, even if they are managing their symptoms okay. It started about two weeks ago before they were just staying at home. I'm sure the government would say they are saving lives by being cautious. I think it's a very convenient way to fill up some beds. After the witty and valance horror stats on the 31st of October, this advice seemed to change. I thought it was strange that the change of advice coincided with the statistics of hospitals being full. I asked a few other team members and they said, yes, they were calling a lot more people who had been admitted to hospital, but were not seriously ill. Now, Liam, that's 
a very extraordinary insight, isn't it? If the 111 advice changed for not very ill people to go to hospital with COVID or potentially with COVID just to fill up the beds to support the dire predictions. That's an astonishing implication. The, the government's own emergency health line is encouraging people to come to hospital mm. in order to promote the view that the hospitals can't cope. Mm -hmm. If that email from somebody who we know is legitimate mm -hmm. and we know is who they say they are, though we're not revealing their identity, no. if that's representative of what's really happening, we are seriously through the looking glass. That's really, really disturbing. I, I keep thinking I can't be shocked anymore, but if anyone, by the way, if anyone works for 111 or Test and Trace or knows someone who does, we'd really be delighted if that story could be supported because it's so important. Liam. Here's one from Matt. After a disastrous breakup and subsequent nervous breakdown in 2016, I managed to destroy a successful career as a sound engineer I'd worked hard to build, and I found myself back at my parents in my 30s and drowning in debt. I fought and fought and started to get back on my feet again and had a lot of work booked this year, which has all been cancelled, of course, because of COVID. So it looks likely I've lost the chance to get my career back and will now be consigned to packing Amazon orders. The whole music touring industry, in which the UK is genuinely a world leader, will never be able to recover if the artists, in quotes, at the very top, don't start standing up for the thousands and thousands of bands, crew, manufacturers, caterers and so on that make up the industry. Well said, Matt. Yeah, I really feel for Matt. My my daughter is in the um, music theatre business and it's been a really parlous time for them. I'm really hoping that it bounces back. Here's a great one, Liam. You'll like this. This is from JL. I have just read the most unspeakably pompous post on Instagram from a member of the sourdough classes saying, <laughs> ooh, you're all welcome at Easter, but please stay away now. It's too dangerous and I can't believe that Boris is doing it. Sourdough as galore piled in to tell her how right she is, how all that matters is to stay safe terrifying these are educated women do they not think their incomes might actually be affected by all this down the line do they not understand lockdown statistics or indeed anything this authoritarian cowardice has become the hallmark of the european soft left it is the new social divide and it shows their utter contempt for those funny little people who are really suffering lost their business can't get cancer treatment trifles of that kind Here's one from Katie. Thanks so much for creating Planet Normal. It's brought me some much needed sanity and comfort for the last six months. I'm in my late 20s and have been very close to mental breakdown several times. I am seeking mental health guidance, which is something I've never had to do before. Wow. Many my age feel as frustrated as me, but don't seem to share the same anger at what our government's done and how it's squashed our freedoms. My biggest concern is how long these freedoms are going to be curtailed for when there's absolutely no need for someone my age to be protected. I feel like I'm being penalised for being a young, healthy person. And I feel particularly passionate about all the things you've said on Planet Normal about children. I work in education and feel strongly the younger generation has been completely let down and this will mar their lives for years to come. Everything the government's done has been a total overreaction and disproportionate. Thanks so much for all you do and for making me feel less alone. Well, thank you, Katie, for such an eloquent email. This really made me laugh, Liam. This is from John in Kent about the Pretty Patel scandal. Perhaps the mandarins at the Home Office have not received yet their full quota of unconscious bias training. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that back in the 80s, the British Army was issued with an underperforming rifle, so much so that the squaddies nicknamed it the civil servant because it doesn't work and you can't fire it. <laughs> that just about sums them up. Brilliant, John. Thank you. And here's Nick. We desperately need a campaign, says Nick, to save our rural village and community pubs because the ridiculous tier proposals on pubs will kill them off forever. There's absolutely no evidence that there are cause of COVID or that eating in pubs is essential or that serving at tables is any safer than ordering at a bar protected by a barrier. But of course, those who've written these rules have no idea how country pubs, the centre of village life, actually operate. All they think about is city centre pubs with crowds of drinkers and many staff. Not a local with no staff, just a landlord who knows most of his locals for whom the pub is the only social life they know. 
How can a Conservative government allow this essential service to die? This is from Dr Mike. Thanks so much to Liam and Alison for our regular flights to Planet Normal. Today I read about the proposed freedom passes for tested COVID-free individuals. What a great idea. But in my view, it doesn't go quite far enough. We need to identify those who might have COVID as well as those who haven't, all those untested people. How about sewing a great big star to their clothing so that we can keep an eye on them? Oh, wait, that's been tried before. Didn't end well, did it? Boris, please note. Mike says, not a medic. I'm almost ashamed to say I'm an ex-government scientist. (laughs) And finally, Penny, the only place for sage this Christmas is up the turkey's bottom. They can get stuff. (laughs) (laughs) so that's it for our latest voyage to planet normal on that bombshell (laughs) strap yourself in for re-entry to the manners of planet earth keep your space suit handy for next week and a saucepan to put on your head because we're back next thursday for another blast off in our rockets of right thinking our capsule of common sense remember that every thursday at 11 a.m co-pilot Halligan and I chat to fellow Planet Normal citizens via the Telegraph website. Just go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash community, click on the article at the top of the page and leave a comment in the comments section. Between 11 and midday, we'll reply to them and have a bit of banter. Please come and join us. And remember, as well as listening to Planet Normal, you can read Alison in the Telegraph every Wednesday and me every Sunday. And so as our beloved Planet Normal fades out of sight once more, an Earth Hoves interview, thanks to our producers Rhys Gunter, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampett, and our editor Theo Leludis. So until our next voyage, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>